So I like your guys' enthusiasm. That's really awesome. Uh, so like as you guys know, uh, so like as you know, so we're starting a new unit. Um, so we're done talking about, I know I brought tissues in case anyone gets really upset about it, uh, but we're, we're moving on. We're not going to be talking about England anymore. I know I'm sorry, but like we're done with that. We're starting a new unit today, which is of course, right, the Russian Revolution. So just so everyone knows, if you're, if you're taking notes, may, maybe you want to start with like a new page, a fresh page. So like right now in your notes, it should be something like, Post-midterm exam. Okay. Post-midterm exam should be in your notes. We're starting an entirely new unit. Use a different colored pen. I don't know, but just make sure that you're uh, that you can lately uh, post-midterm. We're talking about the history of Russia. And one of my favorite people, uh, I know Nietzsche, we're not talking about Nietzsche, we're going to talk about Karl Marx. Okay, so we're going to talk about the Russian Revolution. We're going to talk about Karl Marx. We are not. assigned reader, right? So we're going to be studying Karl Marx and all of that sort of thing. I think it costs like 20 bucks at the bookstore, so make sure that you get your copy of Karl Marx. And let's face it, who doesn't love Karl Marx? You should put his book underneath your pillow at night uh, and read him every night before bed and all of that sort of thing, because uh, that's what we're going to be doing. Okay. Uh, you're going to have your exams back next week. With, with all, I know, with all of the evil teaching assistants comments on them, and all of this, no, I'm just kidding, it's gonna be okay, uh, with all of your comments on them and all that. Uh, hopefully we'll have the grade book, we're gonna have the grade book updated by then, uh, in terms of your paper grades and in terms of your attendance. Some of you have, so there, I've received like a bunch of emails, that some of you are seeing zeros for your paper grades. That's not because you legitimately got a zero and like you failed the assignment and all of that. All you need to do is contact the TA who graded your paper uh, and they will be happy to change the grade. Of course, you're gonna have to show them the paper and show them the grade you got in the paper uh, and then they'll change your grade on uh, black. So I think I, I, I screwed us up. You know I love you guys and I'm sorry about this. Uh, the revised papers are due tomorrow in tutorial. Uh, I know, I know, I know. You can punch me in the gut after <laughs> class or at break or whatever. I'm sorry, but the revised papers, and this actually is good for a lot of you because I know a lot of you, uh, there was like a big kerfuffle and all of this sort of thing about um, uh, some of you haven't picked up your first draft yet. So I have all of the papers, uh, all of your, the unreturned papers in my office. So if you don't have your first draft yet, I'm gonna give you a hard time. I'll probably look at you like, what the heck? Oh, that sort of thing, but come to my office and make sure you pick up your, your paper so you can actually do the assignment. Okay, they're all in my office. Uh, so the revised papers are due tomorrow on tutorial. Uh, if you do, uh, if you, oh, I don't even know what I'm trying to say here, but if you don't have your first draft, come and see me after class. We'll walk over to my office and I'll get you your draft so you can complete the revision assignment. Okay, hopefully you have them already completed. So tomorrow morning or whatever, you can just sort of wake up look at your paper with a fresh eye and make any corrections or revisions or whatever that you want on it. You can also send me an email, ask me questions if you have any questions about it. Uh, the makeup exam is today during my office hours. I know there's like a handful of you guys that should not take the first exam. Uh, in order to take the makeup, uh, you had to have already sent me, <coughs> sent me your medical notes. So I know there's probably a half dozen of you that are like, you know, what about the exam? What about? Uh, so the makeup exam is in my office So far, so good? Ooh, question. Yeah. That's okay. You're good. I'm going to assume that you guys aren't going to profoundly plagiarize your revision assignments between now and tomorrow. Yep. Uh, that stuff is on. That's a great question. So the question is, oh, is the final exam cumulative and all of that? I'll have to check the syllabus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's great because being the professor, it has comes with a lot of perks, and one of those is, is I no longer have to take exams anymore. So it's like I don't I don't pay much attention to, to you know the, the specifics of your guys' exams. Yep.
I'm not like <laughs> No, you don't need to resubmit your first draft. If some of you guys wanted to submit the whole thing in one document, that's fine too. I'm very much like James the First, that we are going to muddle through this. It's going to be fine. We're going to get through this and everything's going to be great. Right. So like if you guys didn't uh, make a mistake and you didn't put in your reflection piece, that's fine. We're going to get over it. We're not going to like deduct points or anything like that. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. new revised draft, and then the short reflection part. So there's three parts, right, to the thing that you are turning in tomorrow at the beginning of tutorial. Is everybody clear on that, that there's three parts? The first draft, the revised draft, and then the, uh, the reflection part. Okay. in European history, okay? So like we're not talking about the 17th century anymore. We're talking primarily about the 19th and the first half of the 20th century, okay? So we're talking about the, uh, uh, the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century. We're talking about European history. So like the, a lot of things change between when we were talking about the 17th century and the 19th. Right, so I'm gonna say that there's a lot of differences between the 17th century and the 19th century. Everything changes, right? So let's talk about this. So when we were talking about James I and Charles and the English Revolution and all of that sort of thing, it was a, it was a fundamentally different kind of economy uh, than what we have in the 19th century, okay? So the 17th century has a vastly different kind of economy than in the 19th century. You're like, Dr. Petrakis, what are you talking about? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, probably the biggest change is that what we see in the 19th century is a movement, right? In the 17th century, we have uh, people primarily farming for a living, right? So this is in the 17th century, there is an agricultural economy. Okay, in the 17th century, during the time of James and Charles, it is an agricultural economy. In the 19th century, there are some profound changes, right? You might say some of the most profound changes happened in the history of the human race. We're talking about industrialization. So we're moving from an agricultural economy to an industrialized economy. Of course, you're like Dr. Petrakis, weren't there still farmers in the 19th century? Absolutely, there were farmers in the 19th century. But the nature of the economy changes. And this is fundamental to our understanding of the Russian Revolution. In fact, it's fundamental to understanding 19th and 20th century history. 
So we're talking about the development of an industrial economy. You have, so like, because there's changes, are you ready for it? You ready for it? Because there's changes in the economic base. So economic base is something you should have in your notes. Because there's changes in the economic base, we see changes in society, culture, and power, right? Because when you change the nature of the economy, everything else changes as well, right? Everything. The, the economic base, everything flows from the economic base. So when we have this change, right, what we have here in the 17th century, you might say like this sort of agricultural economy that we're talking about, like this one, you can say that this agricultural economy is sort of feudal, that this goes back to the Middle Ages, right? This is sort of like a feudal uh, agricultural economy, like when we were talking about James and Charles and all of those guys, right? This is an economy where the, where the, the serfs live and work on the aristocrats' land. So this is like an economy where there are serfs, there's overlords, there is knights in shining armor, there are absolutist kings, right? And this is all part of this agricultural economy, right? Because there, this, the economy is determining the shape of politics and the shape of society, right? They're working agriculture, right? So there's peasants living on the land, there's absolutist kings. Uh, countries are governed by monarchies and aristocracies and all of that sort of thing. Now, this change that we see in the 19th century, like I said, and you should have this in your notes, and remember it for all time, because in the 19th century, the very terms by which people live their lives fundamentally changes. The very foundation of society radically changes with the advent of industrialization. Everything changes. It's, so what we're talking about, and one historian has sort of pointed this out, that like we're talking about one of the greatest shifts in human history. We're saying that the, that the Industrial Revolution was as big a change as when people stopped swinging from vines and spearing swirls and began to live in settled communities, right? So this is a, so like back 15,000 years ago, when people stopped hunting and gathering and started settling on farms, the Industrial Revolution is as big as a change as that. Everything changes, right? We move from Tarzan to farms. Uh, in the Industrial Revolution, we move from farmers to industrial workers, right? So this changes everything. We're moving from a society that's characterized by the feudal system, right, in the, in the Middle Ages and then the 17th century, to a society that is distinctly more modern, right? This is a modern industrial economy. So like, this is major change, right? So you're like, Dr. Petrakis, the foundation, the very basis of society changes with the advent of industrialization, right? We have peasants, serfs working on farms to a situation where you have people living in cities. We have a situation where uh, aristocracies and kings rule Europe to one where parliamentary democracies rule over Europe, right? So we're talking about fundamental changes as the result of the economic base. Okay. So the nature of politics changes, right? So as the result of the changes in the base, changes in politics, changes in society, changes in culture happen, right? So like during this feudal period, during the period of the 17th century with James and Charles and all of those guys, you essentially have a, you have monarchy. You have monarchs ruling all over Europe, right? This is the feudal system where there's monarchs, there's aristocrats, there's knights in shining armor and all of that sort of stuff, right? Because that's the sort of politics that you have when it's an agricultural economy. An agricultural economy favors monarchies and aristocracies, right? With the advent of industrialization, 
everything changes, right? What you have the development of in the 19th century is the emergence of parliamentary democracy, right? So because the base changes, so too does the nature of politics, right? Everything changes because the economy changes, right? We're moving from a system with kings and aristocracies to constitutional parliamentary democracy. Everything changes, right? Not only that, but like society changes, politics uh, changes, and society changes as well. In the feudal period and in the time of James and Charles, um, what we have is like court culture, right? There's court culture uh, and aristocracies hanging out at court and all of that sort of thing. This is a cult, this is a society that's rigidly hierarchical in its nature, right? So this is a hierarchical, aristocratic society in the period of James, Charles, and the Middle Ages. But what we see here with the advent of industrialization is we see the rise of an entirely new class of people, right? So this should be in your notes. With the Industrial Revolution, industry, actually produces new social classes of people, right? So industry produces a lot of goods, right? Manufactured goods, but it also produces an entirely new kind of society. And this is a society characterized by the middle class. So at the future, right? The middle class, this what we're moving towards is a, a, an industrialized economy, parliamentary democracies, and a middle class culture. And I'm suggesting that all of the reasons for this is because of the changes in the economy, moving from a feudal economy to an industrial one. And with that, everything changes. And this is, of course, a very Marxist interpretation that I'm taking for historical development, that from the base, the economic base, all things flow, right? So this is sort of an economic determinist kind of argument that I'm presenting. So let's talk about this, okay? Let's talk about some of the changes in the 19th century, right? So far we've talked about how everything flows from the economic base. We've talked a little bit about politics and a little bit about society. So like I said, the Industrial Revolution is arguably the most pivotal event in human history, right? And it's interesting because it only happened like 150 years ago, right? So like I think it was like the first or second class where I'm saying like, this whole movement of mass education that like look around in this class, this is an experiment in democracy, right? Never before in human history has there have, has the masses, right, all of us, sort of like uh, understood or been taught Plato, Aristotle, Karl Marx, Nietzsche, all of this. Historically, these guys have only been understood by the very richest people in society, right? So everything changes as the result of so it's arguably the most pivotal event in human history, right? We're talking about the movement of an agri from an agricultural society to an industrial one. Okay? So it actually produces, like I said, entirely new classes of people. What you have is the development of the middle class, and we might call them bourgeoisie, because we're taking this Marxist argument today, this is the middle class or the bourgeoisie. There's also another class of people that are produced as the result of the Industrial Revolution, right? You have the development of the middle class, the bourgeoisie, and you also have the development of the working class. And the working class are the proletariat. So you have the development of two entirely new, never seen before in history, social classes produced by the Industrial Revolution. So it's in the beginning of the 19th century that we can start talking about the people and representative government and democracy as characterizing European society, right? So this is like all over Europe, generally speaking, throughout the 19th century, we can talk about this. Uh, we can talk about the people as we understand it. Uh, we can talk about representative governments, and we can talk about democracy, right? And I hope that one of the things that I showed in discussions of the 17th century, the idea that power comes from the people is absolutely ludicrously radical, right? 
And this is the implementation of that political philosophy throughout all of Europe, right? So this is like power from the people is 200 years old. French, English Revolution, French Revolution, and that sort of thing, right? A totally insane idea, right? It actually might be. Who knows if it'll last? Um, so liberalism is one of those big buzzwords of the 19th and 20th century. So liberals, and like you said, and we're going to talk about liberals, we're going to talk about the commies, and then we're going to talk about the conservatives. And like this is all playing out in our, in like the election that uh, Pierre, the the liberals just won, right? We're, we still, to this day, talk about liberals, conservatives, and, com and socialists, right? We won't call them the commies. Usually I, usually I talk, give this lecture to American audiences, and whenever we talk about Karl Marx, I always feel like, uh, you know, white people are going to start throwing tomatoes or something like that. Okay, so uh, liberals, <laughs> this is, liberalism is a buzzword of the 19th and 20th centuries. It comes from writers and theorists like John Locke. So John Locke, in his second treatise of government, uh, articulated some of the tenets of democratic liberal ideology, right? Does anyone know, who's here heard of John Locke? Okay, good. So John Locke is writing in 1688 in England, because the, the English are always on the vanguard of these sort of things. Uh, so John Locke is writing in 1688, and what John Locke is saying is that, you know, Governments exist by virtue of a contract, right? And if the government breaks the contract, the people have the right to overthrow the government, create a new one, uh, and create a new contract. John Locke says that the purpose of government is to protect life, liberty, and property. Right? So this is one of the hallmarks of liberal ideology today. So like what I'm trying to suggest is that like how we live our lives, how we think about politics is deeply philosophical, deeply philosophical. Uh, so the liberals are interested uh, in ideas of freedom of speech, right? So this is liberal ideology goes hand in hand with democracy, right? Because this is an ideology that justifies the rule of the people. So we're talking about, well, in a, in a free democratic society, you have to have freedom of speech. Actually, I'm not too sure about that, because a lot of people say a lot of silly things uh, in the public sphere. But anyway, uh, freedom of speech. Freedom, you know, basically all the crap that we take for granted, right? Uh, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, right, that people can get together, protest, assemble, all of that sort of thing. This is an ideology that says power comes from the developed by Adam Smith uh, in his great book, The Wealth of Nations, right? So free market capitalism is a product of the 18th century, right, uh, by Adam Smith, where Adam Smith says uh, that the government should have no role in the economy, right? So Adam Smith's idea in The Wealth of Nations is that the government should stay out of the economy, that there should be free market. Right? And everyone should be able to participate in the economy equally. Adam Smith's great sort of quote, one that I love to bring up, where he sums up what capitalism is. Right? And so this is the economic system of the 19th and 20th centuries. And what he says is individual ambition, you ready for it? Individual ambition serves the common good. This is what Adam Smith says. This is, this is the very heart of capitalist economic theory that Adam Smith writes about in the late 18th century. So uh, individual ambition serves the common good. What does that mean? What is individual, oh, I know Miranda knows. Miranda's heard this like eight times. Uh, individual ambition serves the common good. What, what does that mean? Has anyone seen the movie Wall Street? What, what, what is individual ambition serves the common good? What does this mean? Someone have their hand up. Yeah, oh, who oh, over there, yeah.
our desire, our desire for more actually serves society and profoundly, um, in profoundly beneficial ways. So this is what Adam Smith said. Individual ambition serves the common good. Uh, and this is intimately tied to liberal democratic theories of government. If you're a liberal in the 19th and the 20th century, what that means is you believe in all of these things. John, you, under, underneath your pillow at night, you put your John Locke, Two Treatises of Government, and you put your Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations because these are your gods, and these are the men that you worship, right? So if you're a liberal. Socialism, uh, oh yeah, of course, and the, uh, the liberal tradition, property rights are the foundation for society, right? So without profit, so capitalism can't exist without property rights, right? Property is the very foundation for society. The Marxist critique of this, of course, is gonna be that liberal democratic ideology supports profoundly unequal societies. We'll talk, we'll get into this in just a second. So socialism is next. The socialists, I always say socialists, I really mean like communists, but I'm too scared to use that word because I think people are gonna start flinging things at me. So I'll just use them interchangeably. And when you guys get into your upper division political theory classes, you guys can fight about the differences. But for our purposes here today, I'm gonna use those words interchangeably, socialist and communist. So the socialists uh, are interested in social justice and social equality. I was talking to my wife about this. We talk, we have these conversations. And like I was, I was, we were talking about this, and like how I think that you can think about this is that like the liberals in the 19th century are interested in political equality. Right? So the liberals are interested in political equality. The socialists and the communists in the 19th century and early 20th century sense are interested in social equality, right? So the liberals are saying that every person theoretically has the right to vote, and of course that's a hard one, right? Particularly for women, uh, but like that the liberals are saying everyone can participate in, in political life, but they're willing to tolerate profound inequalities in society. The socialists are saying, and the communists, the Marxists, are going to say that there's no way. They're saying that, that political or social equality is all important. Right? So the, the socialists, like Marx, they're interested in issues of social justice. They're interested in issues of social equality. This socialism is interesting because it is a political theory that developed as the result of the Industrial Revolution. So this is a political theory that develops uh, during the 19th century out of the, the exploitation of workers, the degradation of the environment, all of that sort of thing. So the socialist communist ideology comes as the result of thinkers and political theorists witnessing all of this crazy stuff that's going on in society as the result of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, so we're talking here about the state ownership of the means of production. So we're talking about the state ownership of property, right? So there are no property rights are vastly different in a communist political system, right? The liberals are all about property rights, but the, but the communists and the socialists say that the state should have everything, right? The, the institution of private property, this is a terrible thing because it only serves to create profound social inequalities in society, right? Uh, okay, uh, so private property rights are curtailed in a socialist or communist political system. Markets are also, so there is no free market in a socialist, communist political system. The markets are tightly controlled by the government. In a socialist or communist system, uh, like in Russia, the one that they tried to, like Russian, the experiment with communism was, was just as radical as the, the development of democracies in the 19th century. This truly is philosophy being put into, put into action. Uh, markets are tightly controlled by the government, and there are no very rich people, and there are no very poor people, theoretically, in a communist society. So I'm from America in Chicago, so I'm from Chicago, which is like one of the most profoundly 
unequal places on the face of the earth, right? So on the north side of Chicago, like where I'm from, uh, it's relatively wealthy, right? You know, you can walk around, there's the Magnificent Mile, there's the Art Institute of Chicago, there's Water Tower Mall and all of that sort of thing, but the south side of Chicago can probably rightfully be compared to Afghanistan, the Congo, uh, Iraq during the war, and all of that sort of thing, right? So I'm saying that like, in, so like an American capitalist democracy, Americans are totally, we are all, Americans are all about political equality, but are willing to tolerate insane <coughs> amounts of social inequality. And of course, there's all sorts of justifications for that. People are lazy, people are stupid. Donald Trump is a great example. Oh, it's the Mexicans, that sort of thing, right? Okay. Uh, so in a socialist system, they're trying to redress this stuff. They're saying that maybe, uh, you know, having a society that's characterized by social equality rather than like uh, political equality, this is the best way, right? So there are no very rich people uh, and there are no very poor people. You don't have places like Chicago or Detroit where I was living before where it's even worse than Chicago, but I wouldn't even get into that here. I mean, like, it's, it's truly horrific. Anyway, uh, so there's liberalism, uh, socialism. Although some of the best Middle Eastern food that you've ever had in your one Michigan. Anyway, moving on. So uh, conservatives. So conservatives, this is like the idea, uh, this is the belief, that really any change is bad. And we're painting here with a broad brush. Uh, the belief that, well, I should say that uh, liberal or socialist change <laughs> is bad. Uh, so the conservatives are, you know, all about the aristocracy. The conservatives support monarchies, right? And in a lot of ways, it's interesting. And maybe it's as I get older. I actually find the conservative political theory more interesting. Because, you know, like when I was your age and all of this, I was interested in the radicals and all of this. But, like, the conservatives actually have something to say. You know? Um, so anyway, so I'm not going to give the conservatives a hard time. Like, they actually have a probably more justifiable point than the, uh, uh, than the socialists and the liberals. But anyway, we all live according to our fictions, right? So uh, the, the conservatives believe that, that liberal or uh, socialist change is bad. They support the role of the church in society, right? So a society that is hierarchical. And there's nothing, I mean, like, really, there's nothing wrong with a hierarchical, hierarchical society because at least you know your place, right? In a democracy, everyone is elected, right? No one knows where they stand in relation to other people. It pr produces nothing but anxiety about the future and all of that sort of thing, right? So anyway, uh, support the church's role in society. They support aristocracies and all that sort of thing. Uh, the Industrial Revolution produces a lot of good things. So I'm not, going, I'm not one to say that the Re Industrial Revolution was a bad thing. I actually think that it produced a lot of really great things, you ready for it, but for a very few amount of people. That Americans, Canadians, Western Europeans, and maybe the Japanese are the only beneficiaries of this economic system, right? So I mean, you know, we'll talk about later, like, you know, oh, why is it that all of my clothes that I buy are made in Sri Lanka? Why is it that all of the computers that I buy are made, are made in Shenzhen province? Why the heck is it that, uh, you know, why are all of these manufactured goods made in places, you know, where labor is cheap, there's no environmental protections and that sort of thing, right? So I just want to make the point that it's really only us that are beneficiaries of this economic system. It produces extraordinary benefits for us and basically the, the rest of the world be damned. Uh, so the Industrial Revolution produces a lot of good things. It produces a lot of good things for us, mass-produced goods. Insanely, we live the best as of anyone in human history, right? Um, so uh, higher standards of living, mass education, right? Like this is something new in history, right? Oh, right. <laughs> like I was saying, it also produces a lot of bad things. So for instance, the exploitation of workers, right? So look no further than some of the oil producing states in the world, right? Like, I don't know how you guys got to school today, but this is an economy that's largely dependent on oil, right? And look at all of those oil producing countries. They're some of the greatest tyrannies that the world has ever seen. And those, those countries essentially exist, 
right? There are people that live across the world that are working and toiling and all of this sort of thing for our benefit, right? Like when we look at where our clothes are, I mean, like I'm part of this too, right? Like this, this thing made in Mexico, right? So it's like we're all part of the system, right? In some ways we can't get away from it. I'm just saying that we are the beneficiaries of this exploitive system. And it's something like, it's, I know some of you guys are like taking a back to like, oh, I never thought of that. But like it is the fact of the matter. Uh, so it produces bad things like the exploitation of workers. It produces environmental degradation. And it produces profound inequalities in wealth, right? So in, in the industrialization has produced a lot of great things, I would say, for us, right, for Americans, Canadians, Europeans, arguably the Japanese, but for everyone else, a lot of misery, a lot of exploitation, and a lot of environmental degradation, profound inequalities in wealth. And so, well, and this is even true, so it's like, look, look no further than America for some of these problems, right? So America, this is like a late uh, industrial capitalist democracy. And what you see in the United States, so that's a, it's a really good uh, illustration of this, is that like industrialization, the, econ the capitalist economy in which we live, produces profound inequalities in wealth, right? So the top 1% uh, own, is what this graph is showing, is one, the top 1% one, uh, one own 43% of all of the stuff in the country. Right? And we'll talk about oligarchies in just a second. So one, the top 1% in the US own 43% of all of the crap, in the, all of the wealth in the country, right? The next 9%, right, own uh, the next nine, so the top 10%, what's 43 plus 40? 83% uh, for these very few people, and the bottom 90 own 17%. Right, so like this is the sort of inequality, I know and like we look to the Middle Ages as like this time of social hierarchy and oppression. It's like this is, this is in some sense even worse because like never before in human history has just a, a few families owned so much and everyone else has owned not nearly uh, as much. I just wanna show you So nearly half of all of the political campaign contributions haven't come from 120 million households, but have just come from 158. Why do you think these 158 families are giving so much money to these political parties? Why would they do that? Absolutely, they, they want the government to represent their interests, right? So, uh, and, and this is, and so like we have something very similar. We're not gonna talk about Guatemalan or El Salvadorian history for this class, but in El Salvadorian history, there's a great illustration of this where uh, 14 families in El Salvador in the 1970s and 80s own everything in the country. And by everything, I mean essentially everything. But here in the United States, right, the Americans always profess themselves a free, a free people in all of this, but it's living in a situation where 158 families are providing half of the campaign contributions for the President of the United States, right? So it should, so like this sort of thing should give us pause just in terms of thinking about the social inequalities that exist as the result of the Industrial Revolution. I'm just simply trying to put this into perspective, to put this in per, uh, perspective for all of us. So 
so we're going to talk about Karl Marx, right? So like this is this is the, the interpretation that I'm giving you. I so let me just step back. So I assign Karl Marx not because he's one of the gods that I worship every night before I go to bed and all of this, but because I think that Karl Marx's ideas, not that they're necessarily like capital T true, universalistic. There will be other communist revolutions, namely the Cuban Revolution, which we're going to study after this, because let's face it, who doesn't love Che Guevara? So uh, the Russian Revolution also follows roughly Crane Brinkman's Anatomy of Revolution. So we see, right, so even though there is a vast abyss separating the English Revolution from the French Revolution, nevertheless, uh, the Russian Revolution still sort of follows Great Britain's anatomy of revolution, where you have the decline of the old regime. You, you know, the czar is going to be shot and killed. We'll talk about that. Pretty often. Uh, I brought tissues. Um, uh, so there's the decline of the old regime. There's the moderate revolution. I love it because it's always like if these revolutions could just stop maybe at the moderate revolution, like things, things might be okay. They never do. The radicals get in charge, start killing people. Uh, we'll talk about that. Sending people to the gulag. Uh, then there's radical revolution. And then, of course, things are totally out of hand, right? And then there's the, the, the development of Joseph Stalin, uh, the dictator. I feel like I should have shown, like, a, what is that guy, Sasha Baron Cohen, the dictator? Anyway, that's what happens. That's what happens here. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. So the Russian Revolution. I don't know why. I always, I always have one more thing. All right. So the Russian Revolution. We have to consider that like, this is deeply philosophical. And this is the reason why we're studying Karl Marx. right? Because like the Russian Revolution is, so it's like uh, Vladimir Lenin here, had sat down and read Karl Marx very closely. And then actually tries to implement his ideas in Russia. He does it and creates the Russian Revolution where people live as communists. right? So this is an actual implementation. It's not, it's not purely Marxist, and in your senior seminars or whatever, you can debate the differences between Marx and Lenin. But my point is, is just simply that Lenin implements uh, Karl Marx's ideas. So this Russian Revolution is deeply philosophical and a reaction to uh, industrial capitalist society. Right, so the, the, the commies are coming up with a, a, what they would consider a better solution to the problems presented by modernity. Right, so that's what we're talking about. So this is actually pretty rock and roll. All right, so let's talk about the czar. So we're talking, so like in your notes, can I move on? Are we good here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, the, uh, so now in your notes it can be something like political institutions in Russia before the revolution. So it's sort of like the same thing, of course. So what is this? Does this guy look happy? No, absolutely not. So this is the czar, right? And the czar is sort of like the Caesar, and don't mess with Texas over here. Uh, his power comes from God. 
power to be God. Uh, and this is a political institution that goes back since the Middle Ages, right? So the czar is like uh, sort of powerful on the level of James the First in the true law sort of thing. So absolutist powers, power comes from God. Let's not be ridiculous. Power does not come from people. The political institutions go back to the Middle Ages. And Russia in the 19th century is definitely not modern, right? Russia in the 19th century is a backward, backward, backward place. So the czar rules supreme. Uh, Russia, in the latter half, in the second half of the 19th century, so Russia in the latter half of the 19th century, accepts Western industrialization. So Russia, you know, looks at the West, looks at Europe, and says, oh yeah, maybe we could industrialize, uh, just like the British, the French, and all of these people, and we would be great. But they accept industrialization in Russia, and this is key. Uh, they accept industrialization in the second half of the 19th century, but they don't accept ideas of Western democracy. So this is this is a question that like political economists are always asking, right? Like even today, the question is like, so can industrialization and capitalism exist in the context of a uh, of a czardom or a monarchy or an unfree society, right? <laughs> So the, the answer, I think, that's been answered, or the answer is, of course, China, right? China can have a profoundly uh, unfree society, yet have, have, yet have capitalism, industrialization, and a middle class, which presents a horrifying potential counterpoint to Western liberal democracy. But anyway, uh, so Russia in the 19th century accepts industrialization, but not the ideas of constitutionalism, liberalism, or democracy. In Russia, there is no parliamentary tradition. So Russia is a backward place, and there is no sort of like um, power, tradition of power from the people. The tradition in Russia has been we're going to be ruled by this guy. Right? So it's like he's not, he's not messing around here, and all of that. Uh, Russia in the 19th century is experiencing a lot of changes. A lot of changes are going on uh, in Russia. There's, uh, with industrialization, there's the emergence of big cities, right? So with uh, industrialization in the 19th century, cities start to get really big. Of course, there's a population explosion. And you have the emergence of the proletariat. Oh, in the back, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, great question. So the question is, is like, so Russia starts to industrialize in the second half of the 19th century. And he's asking, oh, does like the czar own all of the property and all of that? Not really. No, uh, this is largely driven by like an emerging middle class of people, rising cities, the development of a working class. Absolutely. Fantastic question. So we're not talking about truly like James the first true law where the king owns everyone and everything. But there is like private property and all of that in Russia in the second half of the 19th century. Awesome question. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, so there's rising cities, there's population explosion, and there's the emergence of factory workers, right? So this is the development of a bourgeoisie, a middle class, and the very beginning development of factory workers, right? So this happens in the second half of the 19th century. The czar, though, uh, wants to make sure that no liberal, or communist ideas get a foothold in Russia, right? So the czar is more or less okay with this incipient beginning phase of industrialization in Russia, so long as so long as there is not any corresponding crazy talk like power from the people, right? He's willing to tolerate industrialization, a middle class rising cities, but he's not willing to accept uh, parliamentary democracy or a human rights or anything like that, right? Uh, so he puts down liberal ideas and he puts down communist ideas. And with an iron fist would actually be putting it lightly. Like he calls out the troops, right? If there's any sort of like anyone publishing some 
subversive ideas. The, the fist comes down in Russia. This is, of course, a, a painting of Ivan the Terrible. And this is how we should generally conceive of the Russian czar in the 19th and the early 20th. Revolution. So this is where this is headed, right? So this is what the picture that I'm trying to present to you uh, is a czardom, a the only real political institution in Russia that will not change uh, during the Industrial Revolution in Russia. And they're going to be killed. The Romanovs are going to lose their lives with this, right? I think mean, people are like assigning, like, I'm sorry, they died. I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, I don't know. Okay. So we're going to do what ended when we come back. All right, so we're going to take a quick break, my friend. Let's take a quick break, and then we're going to do a 10 minutes.
nine people for Saints <laughs> needed to modernize or else it would be taken over by foreign invaders, right? So this is modernization coming about in Russia through this general recognition that Russia is a backward place and it needs to modernize. Uh, Russia needs railroads, they need better political organization, better political organization, and better ended slavery in the early 19th century and all of that sort of thing. Uh, but it's interesting to note that in America, when, when was slavery ended? When was slavery ended in America? Does anyone know? 1865, right? So this, I mean, so historians give the Russians a hard time for ending slavery in Russia in 1861, and so it's so late. In America, slavery was ended after a bloody, bloody civil war uh, for, uh, in 1865. Alexander II frees the serfs and gives them land, right? So this is, this is uh, uh, the point that I'm trying to make, is that this is Russia trying to modernize. Russia is trying to modernize, Alexander II. Alexander II uh, introduces something called the Zemstvo. And what the Zemstvo is, it's just sort of like a local assembly. This is like Russia, in, it's sort of like crawling by its lips towards like representative uh, representative democratic institutions, right? So Russia, very slowly, it's like uh, Alexander II's like, okay, I freed the serfs, gave them some land. Now we're gonna have local assemblies, right? So this is what's going on. Uh, there's enormous railroad projects. Uh, you know, I mean, like the Russians build a railroad from Moscow all the way to the Pacific Ocean. The, the only thing that comes close to <coughs> rivaling this is the creation of the Canadian Pacific Railroad in the 19th century, right? So has anyone traveled west? I drove my car this summer from uh, Mississauga to British Columbia. Has anyone, has anyone done that? Has anyone seen? Okay, so like, as you know, that this is an insanely ambitious undertaking, right? creating the Canadian Pacific Railroad. There's more land. Russia constitutes one-seventh of the worth of the world's total landmass, 
one seventh. And this is, the, so the Russians build a railroad across one seventh of the world's landmass in the 19th century, right? Which is unheard, of, right? This is like one of the wonders of the world. Uh, Alexander, I brought tissue. Uh, Alexander II, he's assassinated. So like under Alexander II, he like begins, begins crawling by his lips um, uh, the beginnings of modernization in Russia. Very slowly, right? It was like sort of like begrudgingly freeing the serfs. Um, and then, it, then he's assassinated. And his brother comes to the throne, who is an arch conservative, right? So he, his brother that, that comes to the throne after him is an arch conservative that doesn't want to have anything to do with modernity, with railroads, or anything like that. But nevertheless, industrialization moves uh, forward haltingly uh, throughout the uh, throughout the 19th century. Okay. So let's let's talk about this. Can I move on? Can we we good? Okay. Um, so Alexander II uh, is the czar during some of these great reforms, right? He's the czar during some of these great reforms, and he's not known as being a modern. Not really known as being a modernizer, but modernization happens, begins to happen under him. It's important to note that in Russian history, 19th and early 20th century uh, Russian history, change always comes from the top down, right? Political, social, economic change comes from the top. This is not something that's really being generated from the people, but is rather happening policies at the very highest echelon in the Russian government. Uh, like I said, Alexander II, and here he is, oh, this is a great, this is one of those propaganda pieces, and here he is uh, reading his decree, he's like, oh, you guys are free, and they're like, oh, and he's like, now you get to, now you can have your own, so he gives them their own land, here he is, and he's wearing white and all of this sort of thing, he's pure as light, all of this stuff, okay, uh, so he frees the serfs and gives them quite a bit of land. So in other words, he's like, you guys are free now, but you know that land that you've been working, now, now you own it. Right? So he gives them land. Uh, the czar, like I said, also introduces a new system of local government. And this new local government, this is of course called the Zemstev. This is the local assembly. So members of the local assembly, or the Zemstev, are elected uh, by the people, who incidentally are mostly peasants. And also the noble landowners get a voice in this too. The Zemstevo, in other words, voting, or the franchise, uh, is contingent on how much property you own. Right? So it's not like everybody gets to vote, but only those people with a little bit of vote. Uh, the Zemstevo uh, deals with local not confronting issues in the national economy or anything like that. It's really the liberals in uh, Moscow that push for these reforms. So these are the li some liberal thinkers in Moscow say that are hanging around the czar and they say maybe we can introduce haltingly some ideas of self-government in Russia. This happens uh, during the great reforms. And like they start to very haltingly and very slowly introduce ideas of self-government. And they're very slowly going to introduce a more industrialized economy. So this starts in the 1850s. The idea is, is that one day, maybe a hundred years from a, in 1950, the liberals in Moscow think maybe one day, Russia will be ready for some kind of limited democracy, right? But it's in the distant future and all of that sort of thing. Uh, the Zemstvo is seen by a lot of historians as sort of a halfway method about giving the Russian people just uh, a tiny bit of self-government, right? It's like this halfway method. So industrialization, so some of these political changes happen. <coughs> industrialization, right? So a lot of industrialization 
happens, uh, Russia is, of course, a vast landmass. Uh, and the military plan was realized that they need to have efficient transportation systems in case they're invaded by a foreign power. Right? So they're like, so the, you know, the top brass hanging out with the Tsar and all of this sort of thing. They're like, so what are we going to do if like, we're invaded? Right? And they say to themselves, oh, man, we need to get together a system of railroads so that we can move the military all around the Russian landmass. Right? Uh, so first of all, uh, the government begins to fund massing, massive building projects for the railroads. So they start uh, saying, we're going to invest very heavily in the railroads. Uh, in 1860, there was about 1,200 miles of track. So in 18, uh, in 18, what did I say, 1860, there was 1,200 miles of track. In 1880, there was 15,000 miles of track. So just to give you some sort of indication of what they're doing here, the in, during the Great Reforms in the 1850s and the 1860s and all of this, they start to like. So that we can protect Russia if Russia is invaded, right? The Russian planners that are investing heavily into these railroads are also saying that, like, with industrialization, they're going to need to be able to ship all of their mass-produced goods, ship all of their raw materials easily and efficiently across the Russian land. So, the, I mean, what we're talking about here is the development of the Trans-Siberian. Right? And this is really, truly one of the wonders of the world in the 19th century. Right? So like one-seventh of the world's landmass uh, being linked together through the railroads. So the railroads helped Russia, in other words, to move her army over vast distances. And it helps them tie together the nation. Right? So they're tying together what is going to be a vast Russian together uh, this entire landmass here, moving uh, manufactured goods, moving raw materials. They're worried about invasion. Uh, and they're also going to create an empire throughout all of this territory by linking it together. So unfortunately, like I said, uh, Alexander II is assassinated, and his brother, Alexander III, comes to the throne. And where it's sort of like there were the very beginnings of uh, modernization, of maybe some implementation of liberal ideas under uh, Alexander II, Alexander III is a committed reactionary. So he's like very conservative. He doesn't want, personally, he doesn't want really any of these changes going on in Russia. he's the czar and he's against it, modernization precedes halting. So under Alexander, uh, under Alexander III, there's a great bureaucrat that really masterminds Russia's development. So even though Alexander III is sort of like, you know what, guys, I'm not really into all of this industrialization, uh, what Alexander III is sort of interested in is like, you know, that he rules by divine right, that the church has a central place within society, that there is this old school political system in place, but he has this prime minister, Sergei Vicky, uh, that is really the mastermind behind a lot of the reforms that are going to take place between 1815, or I'm sorry, 1850 and 1900. Right? So that he's going to be the mastermind. And he's going to essentially, in some sense, uh, create more or less a more modern Russia. And Vicky is a guy that understands the importance of industrialization. He understands that industrialization is critically important. Russia had lost a couple of wars uh, in the middle of the 19th century, the Crimean War being one of them. So Russia starts losing wars in the middle of the 19th century, and the Russians sort of realize that they need to industrialize uh, in order to compete with other nations, uh, and then so they don't get like taken over and that they don't lose this empire that they're trying to create. 
Russia knows that if it's going to compete on the world stage, it's going to have to compete with the industrialized powers. And the industrialized powers in Europe are, of course, the Germans, the British, of course, and the French. So in order to compete in Europe and be powerful and not be overrun by your neighbors, industrialization was a necessity. And this is something that Sergei Witte figures out and tries to make changes. So what Witte does is he embarks on a program for action. Uh, and he moves forward on really several fronts. So he's going to make some, some major changes. He's an interesting guy because he is literally one of these rising middle class type people that characterized the 19th century. So we can think of Sergei Witte as an educated, middle class, bourgeois sort of guy. Right? He doesn't come from aristocracy. He's a self-made man. He's educated. So he's like one of these 19th century, uh, one of these 19th century middle class he was a railroad manager by training. And you're like, so what is that supposed to tell us? It means that he's, he's profoundly organized, right? So to make sure that trains aren't hitting each other head on. Do they still have those math problems where it's like two trains leave the thing? Okay, so this was with, right? He was the guy that was answering all those questions. This was his profession, right? Uh, so he's organized, he's professional, and he's educated, right? So this is, this is what he's one of these new men of the, of the 19th century middle class. So under him, the railways greatly expand, right? So he's, under him, they're building railways all over the world. And he realizes that these railways are the way of the future. That with industrialization, there is no turning back. There is no turning back on the ideas of liberalism and democracy and industrialization. He realizes that there is no going back, and he wants to bring uh, Russia into the modern world. He even like understands the economy, and what he does is he creates high tariffs. What the heck are tariffs? So he starts creating high tariffs uh, in Russia. What are tariffs? Uh, oh, a couple people know. Awesome. Uh, what this is is basically a government-imposed tax on imported. For this is, is he wants to protect Russian markets so that they can develop. Right? So this is about taxing imported goods from other countries, and the reason why he's doing that is because he wants to protect developing markets in Russia. Because of course, if the British or the French are allowed to import goods for less money than the Russians can make them, it's going to destroy Russian markets. Right? Those businesses will never. So what he understands is he establishes high tariffs uh, in Russia. What he wants to do is to encourage uh, industrial, the manufacturing of industrial goods in Russia. So one of Witte's greatest uh, innovations is that he uses Westerners. He uses people from Western Europe, Europe uh, England, France, and Germany, to help Russia catch up. So he looks to the expert knowledge of the Westerners, right? And so he brings them into Russia to help the Russians modern. So he brings in engineers from Britain. He brings in some uh, investors from Germany. And they set up shop in Russia. And it's these Western industrialists that start planting seeds, like for the steel industry in Russia. Right, because they're setting up shop, they're showing the Russians essentially how to do it, creating uh, steel mills and developing Russia's coal industry. I know this isn't sexy, but this is what we have to talk about before we can talk about the sexy stuff. All right, so I see you yawning and all of this. It's going to be okay. Um, by 1900, by 1900, only three countries are producing more steel than the Russians. So in 1850, they're not doing anything. 50 years later, in 1900, there's only three countries in the world that are producing more steel than the Russians. The British, the US, and Germany. So in, in, in 50 years, they go essentially from producing 
producing no steel to becoming a world leader in steel production. You're like, Dr. Patakis, who cares about steel? This is what all of the machines and the factories and all of that stuff are made of. So that they're producing a lot of steel is indicative that they're, that they're industrializing at a rapid pace. Rush off, this is also, the, and this is important for contemporary politics, uh, this is the point in time when Russia first starts developing its oil industry, right, for energy, its energy sector. So all of this industrial expansion, right, so all of this building, all of this industrialization, all of this sort of stuff, uh, really means one thing. And it means uh, territorial expansion, right? So there's industry, and with this industry, Russia, you know, Russia is like, oh, well, we need to expand our markets. We need to like take over more territory. We need to do all access to natural resources, all of this sort of stuff. So they start expanding their territory. Uh, and by uh, the beginning of the 20th century, Russia is a major territorial power, right? So they're developing industry, and they're developing this enormous, this absolutely enormous empire. When you think of the Russian Empire in the end of the uh, 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, we should think of this as a land-based empire. We think of Britain as a seaborne empire. Russia is definitely a land-based empire. And it's during this, during this period that they come to, to take over, or control, at least nominally, about one-seventh of, of the world's land mass, right? So they're, take, they're taking all of this territory. Uh, okay, so, it's, so Russia develops what are called spheres of influence all throughout, uh, all throughout this area, but particularly in the Pacific. So this, as this territory is expanding, uh, they start to have spheres of influence, particularly on their Pacific um, in fact, the, in the early 20th century, uh, Russian, the Russians begin to encroach on Japanese territory. Right? So there's going to be a Russian and Japanese war in the beginning of the 20th century as Russia is sort of modernizing, creating this empire and all of that sort of thing. They start to encroach on Japan's territory and they have a war over. Uh, the war starts is that the Japanese win, right? <laughs> so the Japanese win uh, the Russo-Japanese War, and this is like an enormous shocker for the vast majority of Russian people. And so now we get into like one of these aspects of modern culture and problems inherent in democracies and all of that sort of thing, is that like you have a lot of racism, right? So like power comes from the people, and that put, that's a, sort of very problematic, right? Because people are prejudiced and all of that sort of thing, right? Uh, so, the, so this loss in the Russo-Japanese War is terribly problematic, right? Because the, the Japanese, according to the Russians, are subhuman, right? So like this is like in a time where the Japanese are seen as subhuman, and of course the Russian people are viewed as like, you know, angelic and godlike and all of this sort of thing, right? So here are some uh, depictions uh, images that I found off the internet that sort of illustrate how Japanese, how the Russians and the Western Europeans sort of view uh, the Japanese. Of course, uh, you know, here this guy kind of looks like like an animal or a snake or something like this. And then I thought this was this is horrific in a lot of ways, but also a little bit funny because it's like you go to um, you know like you go to political rallies when you're a kid, but like apparently in the early 20th century you went to like hate on. Right, you carry around, you're like, oh, these people are terrible and all this. It's like, what the heck is going on? Anyway, so uh, look at how happy they are. They're so cute. Oh, down with the Japs. They all need to die and all of this sort of thing. Right, so this is, okay, good. I know these funny. I hope I'm not offending anyone. All of that. Um, so this is how the Russian people, and indeed a lot of the Western Europeans, viewed the Japanese. Right, they viewed them as subhuman, that these people are no good, and their little kids are marching into the streets down with the Japs, the rats, right? Uh, but the Japanese defeat the Russians in this war, right? So this is a major blow to the ego of the Russian people because it's, of course, how could the subhuman Japanese uh, defeat the Russians in this war, right? How could this possibly be? Um, so this defeat 
uh, by the Japanese uh, means a major blow to the Russian people, right? It brought about uh, political upheaval in Russia as the result of the Japanese victory, right? So political upheaval in the early 20th century starts to happen as the result of the loss of this war. This is the point that I'm trying to make. Uh, the thing is, is that in the early 20th century, all of the major social and political groups have a different solution. So during the 20th, uh, by the early 20th century, some of these liberals, some of the socialists, some of the conservatives, they sort of get a toehold in uh, the Russian public sphere, right? So you have the development of these different political ideologies in Russia by the time we get to the early 20th century. And all of these different groups have a different solution to the problem that's confronting the Russians, right? So they lost this war, and they're like, how could we have possibly lost this war to a group of subhuman people? And the conservatives are like, oh, this is what we need to do. The liberals, of course, have a solution, and the socialists, of course, have a solution as well. So this is producing like political upheaval uh, at home. The workers, of course, say what we need to have is a socialist political system in Russia. That's their solution. The socialists are right. This is an indication that the, the, the Tsardom, the political institutions in Russia, are in decay. We need something new. Uh, the liberals are, of course, like, you know what? The liberals say, what we need is more democratic uh, and liberal political institutions. We need to have the development of a parliament. We need a constitution. We need all of, we need all of these things. That's why Russia uh, lost this war against the Japanese. And of course, the conservatives are like, uh, the conservatives like the, uh, like the czar are of course like, what we need is a stronger czardom, right? We need to have a stronger monarchy. This is why we lost the war. So this war produces a lot of debate and a lot of political upheaval on the home front uh, in Russia. There's also other problems in Russia as well. Uh, one of these other problems centers on, I'm sorry guys, centers on the fact that this Russian empire that they've created doesn't just have ethnic Russian people living within it. About 45% of the Russian empire is ethnically Russian people. There's whole sorts of different ethnicities within the, this territorial empire that the Russians create. Uh, there's Poles over here. Uh, there's uh, some Mongolian people down here. Uh, there's ethnic Japanese uh, over here. So there's all of these different ethnic groups within Russia that are that are that say that we want their own autonomy rather than be controlled over the czar and all of that sort of thing. So the Russo-Japanese War creates a lot of problems. The Poles, the Ukrainians, everybody wants a say, right? There's all of these different ethnicities that could potentially tear the Russian Empire apart. And it looks as though, it looks as though in the early 19th century that the czar is not strong enough to hold the territory together. And this is a really great uh, uh, comic uh, of the period that shows that. So here's uh, Russia, here losing the war. And then this is like, you know, this is the prestige of the Russian government. And of course, the time was running out. So this was uh, from a, a British newspaper, a British magazine called Punch. And what they're saying is that, look at this, after the Russo-Japanese War, the prestige of the czar is absolutely running out. The, the, the tensions that are inherent in the political system are sort of contriving to break everything apart, right? And the British are calling this in the early 20th century, saying time's about to run out for the czar. And of course, here's the czar, Nicholas II, uh, sort of face palming it, going, oh my god, what the heck are we going to do, and all of that sort of thing. At the time, there's the development of a labor movement in Russia. So there, there's what we have is the beginning of labor unions, right? Because Russia is beginning to industrialize, and workers are getting together, and they're saying, hey, man, maybe I'm not going to work 16 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, for my entire life. They're saying, like, maybe we should unionize, all get together, uh, and try to negotiate with the factory owners for better working conditions. So it's during this process of uh, industrialization 
that you have like this incipient or the beginnings of a labor movement uh, in Russia. So, and this is true, and I just want to sort of editorialize about this. Uh, as a result of the great reforms, so like the great reforms from 1850 to 1900 or whatever, what we start to see, and this is true, uh, is that like with rising standards of living, so that's what we're seeing, like they're industrializing, and for the Russian people, there is an increase in the standard of living. But when you have increases in the standard of living, what you get uh, is unhappiness, right? Because people, like when you start getting people that are richer and people that are more socially mobile, uh, what you have is people that ha begin to have expectations about how their life should turn out, right? So it's one of those paradoxes that happens in uh, democracies or whatever, when you have a highly socially mobile group of people, what that actually produces is a ton of unhappiness. Because of course, there is a vast and gaping abyss always between the ideal, what you want to happen, and of course, how things actually are. And in fact, like that was my whole 20s. That's what I did during my 20s, was trying to mediate <laughs> between how I expected things to be and how they really are. Like that's that's the pro that is like the project of adulting. Uh, did I see some hands first hands up? No. Okay. So I'm ruminating on unhappiness. This is something that I'm not I'm not intimately familiar with. Anyway, moving on. Uh, so it's uh it's terribly destabilizing. These rising expectations, the point that I was trying to make, is terribly destabilizing, right? Because people come to have expectations, and when those expectations are never met, and I'm what I'm suggesting is maybe they can never be. Uh, it's, it's politically destabilizing. Um, so workers start to strike for better working conditions and wages, right? Because they believe things can get better for them, right? So they take to the streets. They start, uh, they don't start rioting yet, but they take to the streets, they start to strike. So it's January 1905. Uh, and factory workers in St. Petersburg take to strike. So 1905, it's January 1905 in St. Petersburg. I don't know why they would choose January to strike. Has anyone been to St. Petersburg in January? It's like freezing. But anyway, so they take to the streets. Uh, and there's this guy, uh, Father Gaitan. Father Gaitan. He's a Russian priest. And he leads the striking work. Right? So this is like the, the church is like, absolutely, you know, the church uh, in some ways is really radical. They're like, you know, about equality and all of this sort of thing. So the, the Russian priest leads the workers uh, to the Tsar's Winter Palace. So Father Gapon is like, hey guys, all right, we're all going to get together. I know it's cold out. Look at all the snow and all of this. And he's like, we're going to go to the Tsar's house. He's like, I know where he lives. You know, they brought the, <laughs> they brought the toilet paper and the eggs and they were, no. Uh, so they, they were going to egg his house. But anyway, they go to, so they go to the Tsar's Winter Palace, right? And they're carrying petitions and they're carrying signs calling for justice and they're calling for political reform. So the Tsar hears, right? The Tsar is, of course, at this point in time, uh, Nicholas II. Uh, the Tsar is Nicholas II, the head of state. Uh, the Tsar hears about this, and he's like, oh man, Father uh, Gapon's coming with this whole, like, the marauding rabble, and he doesn't know what to do, so he's like, you know what? I'm just gonna get the heck out of here, and he gets out of town, right? So he hears the mob is coming, he's like, I'm out of here. So the workers make it to the Tsar's palace. And of course, when they get to the palace, they're not like, you know, maybe we need to build a fire or something like that. They're like, we're staying here. They say they are not, they're not leaving, right? Of course, the army shows up, here they are, and they're like, you know, guys, you have to leave. Um, you have to get out of here. It's too cold. What happens? The Tsar hears the, the mob is coming. We, we kind of, you should know the story. The, the Tsar knows the mob's coming, gets out of town, called in the army, the mob doesn't leave. What's the, what's how's this how's this recipe end? Bang bang. Bang bang. Absolutely. The the, uh, the army opens fire on the priest, and they open fire on the striking workers uh, on the unarmed demonstration, and they kill more than three hundred people. About a thousand are wounded. And this event in Russian history is known as Bloody Sunday. <clears throat> so at the time, right. Uh, Russia is still at war with Japan, uh, and there's all 
also Russian troops uh, in Asia and in China. So there's still fighting. Um, so there's, uh, there's no troops to stop the impending revolution. So like there's, there's some really, this is like a powder keg situation. And at the time, uh, there aren't that many Russian soldiers in St. Petersburg because the vast majority of the Russian military is in Asia and in Japan fighting wars of territorial expansion. So there's like, you know, like this is all of them. There's like seven or eight guys here or whatever. They have guns, the other guys don't. You know, and of course you, you have to know the demonstrators are like, they, would, they wouldn't shoot a priest in or they shoot a priest and all this sort of thing, right? So I know it happens, it happens all the time. Uh, Latin Americans are pretty well known for this. Anyway, so uh, there's like seven or eight guys here and the rest of the Russian military is off fighting wars of territorial expansion. Um, so what does the Tsar do? What the Tsar does is he actually accepts some of the demands of the striking workers. What he wants to do is give in to some of the demands of the workers to stave off full-on revolution in Russia. So the Tsar, the Tsar creates something called the October Manifest. This is the October Manifesto, and this is the first real attempt at constitution. So you can think of the, of the uh, October Manifesto uh, as a liberal constitution. Right? So this is like Russia is crawling itself by the lips towards a liberal democracy, but it's doing it haltingly only after they kill over 100 people and all that sort of thing. But this is the first real attempt at constitutionalism. It's a liberal document. What they do is they create a new political institution called a Duma, and the Duma is sort of like a party. They start talking, and like this is a terrible idea, um, as we'll find out. Uh, they start saying, oh yeah, free press, great. We're giving in to, to some of these liberal demands of the workers, uh, and of course there's a free press. I guess the Tsar probably had no choice. He probably felt that every other nation in Europe was more or less a liberal democracy, and that it was time to modernize Russia, and uses this uh, revolt by the workers as a pretext to give in to some of their demands. But it's sort of foolish in the sense that, you, that what the Tsar is going to do is he's going to grant the Russian people a degree of political autonomy. He's going to open up the public sphere for debate and all of that sort of thing with the free press, but he's not gonna give them enough <coughs> say in politics. And this is going to create a really big problem, right? Because people are going to have be free to criticize the government, but they're not going to be free to make any political changes for themselves, right? So he gives them free speech, but it's like he doesn't give them political participation. Uh, political parties start to develop. So I guess in 1905, it could be in, in your notes, something like the crap is about to hit the fan, right? There's free press, there's political parties start to develop. There's this very beginning of parliamentary uh, the October Manifesto is seen as like a, a liberal constitutional document. Oh, oh no, guys. Uh, political, political parties are to develop. So anyone have kind of a time for this? Is it 57? 57, all right. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna let us go on that because what we're gonna talk about this next, our next class is totally rock and roll. It's gonna be awesome. I look like we're doing, I know it's too bad. I wish these classes were like every day. I have so much fun in here. Uh, let me know if you guys have questions about anything. Your case